Welcome to Tremophonic Audio Stories. Tremophonic, The Sounds of Fear, is a collection of original horror stories presented in audio format. Today's story, In Sheep's Clothing, was written as a project of passion and is free to listen to. Please visit tremophonic.com, follow our Tremophonic social media and podcast accounts, and share our posts and stories to a wider audience. You can also find us on Patreon and buymeacoffee.com if you want to support the development of future stories. This is In Sheep's Clothing. A fresh breeze ran through the forest that morning, washing into a clearing amongst the trees and kicking up swirling dust around a small, thatched cottage. This was a morning like many before it, but on this morning the peace would be broken, much like the pane of glass in the side window was broken, and smeared with blood. The elderly lady that lived in the cottage descended her rickety wooden staircase, creaking loudly with each step, until abruptly she stopped and looked at the destruction inside her home. The kitchen had been ransacked, doors pulled from their hinges, drawers strewn across the floor, and her fresh food in a mangled mess underfoot. Her cosy chair was shredded, the inside spread across the flagstones, and there, on the sheepskin rug in front of the hearth, a young teenage girl, wrapped in a crimson cloak, lay curled up for warmth from the smouldering embers of the fire. The old lady shrieked, You! The girl startled and turned. Who are you? Why are you here? And what have you done to my house? The girl looked frightened, but the old woman persisted. You better not be. They better not have sent you. As the girl struggled to her feet, the old woman pushed the stunned girl towards the kitchen, picking up a dining chair that had been tipped over, and with a firm palm on the girl's shoulder, forcefully sat her in the seat. Before she could gather her thoughts, the old lady had whipped back the girl's scarlet hood, and was tipping her head from side to side, like she was inspecting her for injury. But while it might have seemed that the old lady was doing her a service, the girl felt her hands being grasped behind the back of the chair and rapidly tied to the wooden slats. The girl, trying to exclaim and question her treatment, opened her mouth to speak but found a cloth being pressed into her lips and her cheeks pinching as the old lady hastily gagged the startled girl with a strip of torn fabric. You're staying put there while I decide what to do with you. You may just be a burglar or a thief, but I can't take my chances. The old woman turned and picked up a few items from the floor, including a second chair for herself, and sat across from the girl. She rested her elbows and forearms flat against the table, and stared the girl in the eye with a furrowed brow. I don't know who sent you, or what you're looking for, but let me explain something to you. Yes, I'm a witch, but you small-minded townsfolk can't seem to accept that not all witches are mean-spirited or evil. I grew up in a coven. My mother was a member of their order before me. But when I reached sixteen, 
they wanted me to join their ranks. But by this time, I knew the evil that my mother's order stood for. Fire witches, they called themselves, bent on perfecting the manipulation of the flame to their will, conjuring flames in their hands from nothing but dust. Intent on destruction, and hungry for power. But I could see more to this world. I could see the good. I turned my back on their archaic dark practices. I ran away to seek a way to use my magic for good, for healing, for building, for the benefit of those around me. Since then, I've had to be wary. The coven wants me dead. Desertion is not permitted after training has begun, and with me being a blood relative to a senior member of the Order, it was especially insulting to our High Priest. The last words I heard from my mother were equally uncaring and threatening. She simply said, May your magic serve you better in another life. So I must assess the nature of any guest I might have in my home. Your actions and reactions will reveal you. As the witch told her tale, she pottered about the kitchen, preparing some leftover stew and boiling a kettle for tea. Everyone assumes a witch is inherently evil. The amount of stick I get for it is unbelievable. Someone, God knows who, keeps sending their well-trained wolf after my pigs. I've had to replace the sty a few times now. I started with one made of hay bales, but that was ripped down way too easily. I tried to reinforce it with some fencing made of hazel and willow twigs woven into panels, but no, even that wasn't keeping this wolf out. So I've had to resort to making it out of stone now. It's a ridiculous amount of work, ridiculously expensive, and I've lost a few pigs along the way. Then there was that little blonde girl. Not even from the town. She, she lives in a cottage not too far from here. She's a strange one, though. She's got some odd relationship with a family of bears. She claims that I turned her parents and little brother into bears. She came home one day to find her family gone, but instead these three bears were eating the breakfast from the table and sleeping in the beds. I have to be wary now. Walking out in the woods near her house, she set the bears on me from time to time. Oh, and then recently I tried to help these two lost children, but you'll never believe the way they treated me for it. They were all alone and so hungry that they were eating the moss of the stone walls of my house. I invited them in to eat some proper food, but I didn't even manage to finish cooking it. Maybe it was the hunger, or maybe there were some dodgy mushrooms they ate outside, but the boy started poking me with chicken bones, and the little girl tried to push me into my own oven. Before I'd recovered from that ordeal, they'd stolen my purse and run off back towards town. And now I wake up to find a little girl in a red cape curled up in front of my fireplace, having broken my window to get in, and trashed my house. You could have at least knocked. I would have welcomed you with open arms, but now my blood is starting to boil. But no, I will not harm you. I may restrain you as a precaution, but dine with me. Drink with me and tell me, what is your story? The old witch ladled out a bowl of boiling broth for the young girl and laid a cup of freshly brewed tea next to it. Seeing the calmness and lack of threat from this young, frail child, 
she removed the gag and released her hands from behind her back. The girl graciously accepted her treatment by the witch, tasting the stew and sipping her tea, but all the while she fixed her eyes upon the woman. Her brow furrowed in judgment, watching every move and assessing her situation. Having eaten about half her food, the girl spoke to tell her story. Old crone, you make yourself sound so innocent, but I know that taste of muscle and gristle. This broth you feed me is from no beast, it's meat of human origin. You see, last year I went to visit my grandmother at her cottage deep in the forest. When I got there, around dusk, she sat in bed, shrouded in blankets and darkness, with just a candle lit by the bed. She was unwell, it was clear to see. The previous day, while out foraging for berries, she'd been attacked by a wolf, but not killed. That wolf had only taken a taste of her withered leg before it realised the lack of nutrients she'd provide, and left her hobbled on the ground. My grandmother staggered home and into bed where she lay for a full day day until I arrived that following evening. As the daylight faded, the full moon shone like a lantern in the sky, but inside her cottage her one candle lit her face. As I approached I saw her glinting eyes, but also a deformed nose with snarling teeth. Her malady was supernatural in nature. She was becoming that which had bitten her, half a woman, half beast, a werewolf. Such a sickness does in fact give ferocious strength and speed, and while I turned to run faster than I've ever moved before, I had only taken two steps away from the bed before I felt the sharp scratch of claws upon my back, knocking me to the ground. I turned to see what fate beheld me, and I lay under the window with the moon upon my face. My grandmother, the beast, paused, as if the human part of her recognised me and bore me no ill will. For what felt like forever we held each other's gaze, eye to eye, unmoving. I could feel the scratches burning as if some creature was crawling into my skin, but still I held her lingering look as it turned from ferocity to calm. It was as if she felt her job was already done. My grandmother, the wolf, eventually turned and slowly walked on all fours back to the bed, retreating into the darkness, the candle now extinguished. The wound upon my back had me paralysed in pain and fear. I sat under that window in the moonlight, keeping deathly still until the morning came my eyes fixed upon the bed the entire night. When daylight finally hit the room, I watched the blankets retreat, and my grandmother rise from the bed as if her aching joints were oiled and repaired, as sprightly and healthy as ever I've known her. When she saw me on the floor, a sudden look of realisation came over her, like she remembered every event from the night before. My de-aged but familiar grandmother 
lifted me to my feet, and we sat by the fire together while she told me of her experience with the wolf. Her injury had turned her into this thing, and she thought it possible that my injury might do the same. So I agreed to stay with her until we could be sure. As time passed, sure enough, the next full moon, I felt the lunacy as the lycanthropic urges surged within me, as my flesh distended and grotesquely altered. But of course, as the legends tell, this was only for the nights of the full moon. But on those nights, each month, my grandmother and I would hunt together and feast upon our well-earned prey. Which brings me to our current predicament. You see, last night was the first night of the full moon. The monster within me broke your window, ransacked your furniture and curled up by your fire, and now as the day wears on, I fear if I should be here when the sun disappears beyond the horizon, the consequences would not be good for you, dear witch. The witch's lips pursed as she deliberated what to do about a wolf within her home. The witch knew her powers were next to worthless against a creature of the night. She understood clearly that Magic does not fight other magics well, especially lunar magic that runs in the blood. Be gone with you, little girl. Take your crimson cowl and leave my house. To think I almost came to pity you. Yet here you accuse me of eating human flesh, and you threaten me in my own home. If I were half the evil witch my coven would have made me, I would have already picked the dust from this old table and turned it into fire inside your lungs. She picked up her earthenware mug of tea, blowing gently on the top to cool it. She sneered. Go! The girl stood and silently turned with a sweep of her red cloak speeding towards the door, not looking back even for an instant. As she reached for the door handle, the girl spoke one more time. May your magic serve you better in another life. Upon hearing this phrase, the witch's grip on her mug was loosened the vessel shooting to the floor and shattering. The girl rushed out of the door and took just five long paces before she stopped. She raised a hand, shoulder high, fingers pointed upwards as if to hold something. Then, turning a quick twist of her wrist, the swirling dust on the breeze created a spinning whirlwind of dirt around the whole cottage. The old witch looked out of the broken window with wide eyes as dust flew in and filled her lungs. She saw the young girl raise her other hand and with a click of her fingers, every speck of dust turned to flame, engulfing the cottage and the witch within, the thatch roof roaring above with flickering ferocity. In a matter of seconds, the whole building was reduced to ash. The girl in the red riding hood dropped her hands, with which the flames extinguished and the whirling wind ceased. A flattened square of blackened ground was all that remained of the building that once stood. Alongside it, a stone-built pigsty 
with three squealing swine cowered within. The red-hooded girl brushed down her cloak, looked over her shoulder with a wry smile, and disappeared into the forest. Thank you for listening to In Sheep's Clothing, presented by Tremophonic. In Sheep's Clothing was written, performed, recorded, and edited by Richard Wilson, with music samples and folio effects from Feslian Studios and Pixabay. Don't forget to follow Tremophonic on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and Tremophonic.com, and keep an eye on podcast channels for our upcoming stories. As a self-funded project, we would appreciate any support you might be willing to give us on patreon.com forward slash tremophonic or buymeacoffee.com forward slash tremophonic. Thank you for listening. <laughs>